Okay, praise the Lord and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for uh, joining class. Jay Masiki. All our in person students love it when I say Jay Masiki and they're all excited. So, for their sakes, just for them to make, uh, make them feel more at home. Okay. Uh, we'll continue studying with, uh, uh, continue looking and studying chapter 12. Uh, Christ's resurrection and his exaltation. Um, before we do a recap and continue, we'll pause for a word of prayer. So can any one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone from our in-person students who haven't prayed so far? Or online students, anyone who hasn't prayed? Can you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Nobody wants to pray? Anyone on an online students like to pray, please? Yes, sister, can I pray? Yes, please, Sister Clement, uh, Esther, yeah. somebody. Yeah. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father God, we praise and thank you, Lord God, for your wondrous works in our lives. So, Father God, this morning time, as we are part, uh, Lord God, going to listen from your word, oh Father God, help it take root in our lives and bring forth much fruit for your glory, oh Father God. Lord, bless the time. Lord, uh, bless Sister Selena, she's, uh, Lord God, teaching us, help us as students to imbibe it in our lives, Lord God, and bring glory and honor to your name. For we ask all this in the most precious name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Esther. So in uh, chapter 11, we're basically uh, studying uh, Christ's resurrection and his uh, exaltation. We looked at scripture references with the uh, foretold uh, Christ's resurrection. We also looked at various references where Jesus himself, uh, you know, said he would you know, die and be resurrected. Then we looked at the references where he showed himself alive after his resurrection. So we looked at uh, the proofs that Jesus indeed was resurrected from the dead. We also looked at the nature of Christ's resurrection and uh, we were looking at and studying the doctrinal significance of his resurrection. Okay. So in the doctrinal significance of Christ's resurrection, we basically studied three points. The first one is Christ resurrection ensures our, what does it ensure? What does it ensure? Our regeneration, yes, thank you. Um, and Christ resurrection ensures our, second one, justification. The third one is Christ resurrection ensures that we would receive perfect resurrected bodies as well, so that's the third thing, okay? So Christ's resurrection ensures our regeneration, it ensures our justification, and it ensures that we will receive perfect resurrected bodies as well, okay? And we had a good time of um, discussing um, uh, last time that uh, some good questions that were raised. So we see that uh, we all, uh, so just to, kind of, um, you know, um, answer those questions, those doubts, uh, and just to clarify things. I'll just restate some of the things that I said, which are very, very important. Uh, we, we see several times in the New Testament uh, where there's a connection between Jesus's resurrection with our final body resurrection. Okay, Jesus is the first fruits of those who resurrected from the dead. But we also see in Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament, there are various places where it connects with our finally bodily resurrection. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, And God raised Jesus Christ from the, and and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up with power. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14 says that he who raised Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with him into his presence. Okay, so we will also be raised up from the uh, dead just as God raised up the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and uh, when we are raised up, 
from the dead, we will have what kind of bodies? Glorious, imperishable, spiritual bodies, okay, that is raised in glory and raised in power, okay. Just like Jesus, we also will have glorified, resurrected spiritual bodies. And we see that Jesus' body was also uh, raised up. It, he had the same physical body, but it was a transformed body, which means that body will never again suffer, will never again die, will never again be, uh, you know, face any kind of illness or weakness in the same way. We will also have our physical bodies, but we are transformed body where we will not suffer. We will have no weaknesses. We will have no illnesses and we'll never die. Okay, So death has put on immortality. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 53 where Paul talks about the resurrected body in first Corinthians chapter 15. And then he says in first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 42 to 44, he talks about what kind of bodies that we will be raised up in, which we, we which I just mentioned, okay? Um, so we see that when Jesus was raised up, he had a physical body uh, that could be touched, that could be handled, okay? So we see, uh, we read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, when the women came to the tomb, um, they found the tomb empty, but when Jesus met them and said, greetings, what did they do? They clasped on to his feet and they worshipped him okay so uh, shows that he had a physical body where he held on to his feet and then he appeared to uh, his disciples on the road to Emmaus Luke chapter 24 okay just like any other traveler he talked with them and they might they did not they were you know uh, they could not recognize him or their eyes were closed they were not able to see that it was Jesus and when Jesus came and stayed with them he took bread and he broke it. Okay, Luke 24, verse 30. Uh, we also see that Jesus eats a, a, a piece of fish that is boiled, which clearly shows that he had a physical body and he was not just a spirit being. Okay, In John chapter 20, verse 20, he also shows his uh, hands and his, uh, his side that was bruised and hurt. In John chapter 20, verse 27, he asked Thomas to touch his nail pierced hands and and his side um in the sea of Ti or uh, sorry the shore of the sea of tiberius when the disciples come back from uh, fishing he makes breakfast for them okay so john chapter 21 and also we see in uh, in luke chapter 24 um when Jesus met them on the road to Emmaus and when he comes there and he meets um, the disciples and he stays with them and he breaks bread and they realize that his, their eyes were open and they realize that it was Jesus. Then he disappears and then they're talking about him and then he reappears to them. And then he, uh, he says, see my hands and my feet. Luke chapter 24 verse 39, he says, see my hands and my uh, feet, handle me. Uh, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have. Okay, So we see that Jesus, uh, when he resurrected, he resurrected in a, uh, he had a body. Yes, I think you're very <laughs> eager to ask your question. It's a very silly question. So Sorry? It's just a silly question. So I was just thinking to ask or not to ask. But, no, no, no. No problem. Uh, ask. So in resurrected bodies, when we are resurrected, so when we have our glorious body, do we eat? Do we eat? Uh, Jesus ate. He had a glory. He had a glorious, transformed body, just like us. He ate. Yes, but in heaven we don't have to uh, eat because uh, there'll be no hunger or there'll be no thirst. Um, but yeah, we can, just like Jesus did. <laughs> you love me. You love food, huh? <laughs> okay. So uh, we see that uh, Jesus had a bodily, uh, you know, he had a, a body, physical body. And it's also true that Jesus, you know, was able to appear and disappear. Okay. Luke chapter 24 on the same thing that I said, the road to Emmaus when he met them and he came, you know, and he broke bread and they realized it was Jesus. They, their eyes were open. They realized that it was Jesus. He suddenly disappeared. Right. 
and uh, again he suddenly appears to them and then he says what he says in Luke chapter 4 verse um, uh, 39 see my hands my feet and not a spirit being but I'm I'm um, I'm flesh okay I have flesh and um, bones and also we see read in John chapter 20 that Jesus suddenly appears to his disciples and they were all very very uh, startled John chapter 20 verses 19 and 26 okay so when Jesus is um, telling them hey touch me see me you know handle me I'm not just a you know, spirit being and flesh and bones. Why was Jesus doing that? Why was Jesus doing that? That he is resurrected in a bodily form. Yes. So he was trying to prove to them that he has been resurrected and he has a physical body. And he wanted, he knew his disciples were going to record that. And that the recording is so important for you and me. And for believers to know that we too will also have this kind of a physical body, but be a transformed body. Okay. So if Jesus, um, you know, so when when we when we uh, I think Sister Gertrude uh, asked this question, you know, so was Jesus spirit being, or he had a physical body, or you know, sometimes was he, um, uh, you know, sometimes did he appear physical, sometimes did he appear non-physical, uh, you know, or was he um, he could he materialize and dematerialize at the same time? So you know, um, what is the whole thing about? when he just appears to them in Luke chapter 24 and then he uh, disappears. Now we cannot read too much into that and draw too many conclusions. So what can we basically conclude from Luke chapter 24 is that, you know, that the disciples no longer saw Jesus. Okay. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord took him away. Okay. Uh, like we see that, you know, spirit of the Lord took away Philip after his encounter or his meeting with the Ethiopian uh, treasurer, the spirit just took him away. Or maybe he was just hidden from their sight, like um, on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was hit uh, and they couldn't see uh, him and Moses and Elijah. Or um, that is in Matthew chapter 1. Or also, I remember I told you uh, about the incidents in, in Acts chapter 5, when the apostles were all put into prison. And in the night, the angel came and told them, you know, go and preach in the synagogue. And they all walked free from the prison and all the, uh, the, the, the guards were there, but nobody saw them. And the next morning, when the official sent for the uh, the soldiers to bring the apostles from the prison, they saw that the guards were standing there. The door was securely shut to the prison, but the apostles were missing. So what can we infer is just that, you know, it's not that the apostles dematerialized and materialized or so they became non-physical and physical. No, it's just that maybe the angels just opened the door for them and, you know, they walked through. And the, 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 the guards were not able to see or blind. The angels just blinded the guards' eyes. Now, what, what can we infer from Acts chapter 12 when Peter was in prison and, you know, the angel of the Lord wakes him up in the night and his chains fall off. And then, you know, he thinks he's seeing a vision except when he comes and the main gate of the city is opens. Then he realizes the main gate of the city just opens and then it just shuts by it. So, and then he realizes, hey, this is not a dream or vision I'm seeing. This is real. So it's the angel of the Lord that uh, did it. So in, in Jesus' case, uh, we see that Jesus has had a transformed uh, physical body. Okay. And we can merely, what can we say when we read um, Luke chapter 24 or when we read John chapter 20 is just that the disciples could not see him any longer. Okay. So if Jesus wanted his disciples to record that Jesus had a physical body, okay, then he was, you know, he was just clearly, you know, telling it to them so that they could record it for uh, them. But if Jesus, you know, had a non-physical body and then he was having this repeated physical appearance, which means that he would be guilty of misleading the disciples because why would he be guilty of this 
misleading the disciples because he very clearly says in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, look at me. You know, he says, I have flesh and bones, you know, see, touch, handle for yourself. You know, I'm not a spirit being, but I have flesh and bones. So Jesus is saying, hey, I have a physical body. So he was not, you know, he was, uh, if he was actually uh, did not have a transformed body, he had a non-physical body and he was appearing physical. That means he was misleading his disciples, which is not God's nature. Not to lie and not to mislead. Okay. So if Jesus wanted to teach his disciples that he was non-physical and that, uh, you know, that he was dematerializing and then he was materializing or becoming physical, then he would have clearly showed it to his disciples. He would have seen, he would have shown them walking through the wall or going out through the wall and coming through the sun. But here we don't see them seeing him go through a wall and all of those things. It just says that he appeared and he disappeared. So he would actually get them to watch the, him going through the wall and coming from the wall, which he did not, which means that, you know, Jesus was saying, hey, I have a physical body. It's not a non-physical uh, body which and a dematerializing body which materializes of or, you know, becomes physical at times, but I am flesh and mm, blood, okay? So, that is what we can conclude from these two um, things when Jesus just appears and disappears. Of course, the road to Emmaus, uh, it very clearly states that the disciples were, eyes were shut, they were not able to recognize Jesus, but when their eyes were opened, they were able to recognize that it was uh, Jesus, okay? So is, I hope there's clarity so far. Yes, no. Yes, now you're able to understand. Yes or no, very important. Okay, some of you are in Wonderland, La La Land, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> okay. Sister, I have a question. Yes, is to get to it. In heaven, he is in physical body or spiritual body? Sorry? In heaven. He is with, sitting at the right hand of his father. Is he in physical body or spiritual body? It says, right, when the, the same Jesus that you see taken away will come back again. Right? In Acts chapter 1 verse 11, uh, where it's, it says, you know, when, when Jesus, uh, you know, was taken up to heaven, you know, the uh, uh, angel immediately told the disciples, uh, you know, Jesus who's taken up into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Uh, which, which just clearly is Jesus' is teaching that his resurrected body was a physical body. Okay, sister. So we need to, you know, basically look from other scripture passages and find out answers, right? Yeah. Yes, good question. Anyone else? Oh, we can move on. Okay, just before we move on, if there's no more questions, no more doubts, uh, we we'll look at the ethical significance of the resurrection. Okay, well, we looked at the doctrinal significance, we looked at the nature of um, the resurrection, we will look at the ethical uh, uh, significance or the moral significance of resurrection. Okay, so. Um, Paul, when he looks at the uh, uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, um, he says it has an application uh, to our lives, not just what we can receive, but also what we need to do. What is our ethical obligation that we have to live our lives in obedience to uh, God. So after his long discussion about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. What does Paul write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58? Can somebody read that, please? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. So Paul is encouraging the church at Corinth, 
what is he telling them be steadfast immovable okay abounding in the work of the lord knowing that your labor in the lord is not in vain okay so uh, when when we are when we are raised up with christ you know we are dead we spiritually identify with christ in his death in his burial uh, in his resurrection you know when he says we too will be raised up from the dead you know uh, paul is saying that uh, hey this should give us something some motivation motivation what is that motivating motivation that we should be steadfastly continuing in the lord's work okay which means that even as we enjoy these spiritual benefits okay there's something that we need to do we need to bring other people into the kingdom of god we need to build them up in the kingdom uh, principles the kingdom values we need to build them up in the lord and this is our uh, you know uh, eternal uh, uh, significance that it has this is something that's eternal that we can do you know when we usher in people into the kingdom of god it has an eternal uh, significance because he says that you know we shall be raised on that day and when christ uh, returns we shall live with him for ever okay so what should be our response to christ's resurrection it's not that hey you know i am happy that i'm resurrected i am happy that i have um, you know um, have eternal life but we need to also you know be steadfast in the lord's work in the sense that we need to preach and teach and usher in others into the kingdom of god uh, because that has eternal uh, significance okay the second ethical si si uh, uh, significance that christ resurrection uh, that paul encourages us is that you know when when we think of resurrection is that we need to focus on our future heavenly rewards as our goal okay so uh, you know paul is saying that here on earth when when you know we know that you know in paul's life even as he did god's will he, he established churches he preached he um, mentored he he raised up many uh, leaders you know and he uh, was an apostle uh, he did mighty works for the lord but we see that he goes through severe persecution he goes to severe trials and problems and difficulties he was even thrown into prison and uh, uh, eventually he was martyred okay so what does he say when he's you know he says when he's even writing to titus and timothy this his last letters from his roman imprisonment he says you know you know um, i have fought a good fight i have you know kept the faith and there is for me a reward in heaven and he's looking up for that hope that that it that hope that hey this life yes i'm going to die i'm going to be martyred you know it's going to be a cruel death but there is hope in the future okay there is a goal that we can look for there is a reward and that is what he's encouraging young timothy and titus who are he's put in very difficult churches timothy in ephesus and uh, titus in the island of crete to oversee the churches it's very challenging very difficult but he's encouraging them and say don't leave your post don't leave your um, uh, assignment what god has called you because look at the greater um, reward okay so yes even as we go through life there will be struggles there will be a lot of challenges you will be persecuted you can also be martyred but then um, we need to focus on our resurrection okay our future the heavenly reward that we would receive and um, what is our goal the eternal significance of what we are living for and what we are um, doing and that is what paul says you know if you have been raised with christ what does he say seek the things what does paul say when you're raised with christ seek the things that are above where christ is seated at the right hand of god and he says set your minds on things above and not earthly things because your your life is you know um, for you have died and your life is hidden with christ look at colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 can somebody read that please Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 to 4. Anyone would like to read that? Colossians. Then, you you can Sorry, read. Go ahead, Warren. 
Okay. Uh, one to four. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. So here what is Paul encouraging uh, the church at Colossae? He said, set your minds on things above. That means set your minds on things that are eternal, that are not temporary, that are not uh, earthly. Um, because he says that you're, you have died with Christ. And your life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ appears, you will also appear with him. That's, which means what? That will be your heavenly reward. Okay, You belong to him, belong to uh, in a part of his kingdom, kingdom citizens, sons and daughters. And that is your uh, reward. That you will also appear with him in glory and you will live with him in glory. Okay, So that is the second ethical significance of Christ's resurrection. The third ethical um, application of Christ's resurrection is, um, you know, what we have already looked at what Paul writes in Romans chapter uh, 6. So read, uh, some of, one of you can read Romans chapter 6 verse 11, please, where Paul is talking. The third ethical significance is that we need to stop yielding uh, to sin or giving our lives over to sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 11. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, so it says that you also must be dead to Christ and alive to God in Christ uh, Jesus. Uh, Deepu, is your name Deepu or do you have another name? Deepu Mascarenas. Oh, Deepu Mascarenas. Okay. Okay. Deepu, uh, you have a lovely voice. Very smoothing, very calm, nice voice. Yes. Nice. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So here it says, you know, you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay. So by, uh, we looked at this verse, we studied this verse, and we said, you know, by the virtue of Christ's resurrection, yeah, by his resurrection power that is in us, we can overcome sin and we need not yield to sin. And then he goes on to say immediately in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. Can somebody read that, please? Romans 12 and 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Amen. So here he says in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, 13, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. And he says, Do not yield your members of your body to sin. Members means the parts of your bodies, your faculties. Do not yield them to uh, sin. So the fact that we spiritually identify with Christ's resurrection, we are a new creature in Christ. Uh, we have this new resurrection and because uh, we are a new creature in Christ, we have this new resurrection power in us. We have the life and nature of God in us. And this new resurrection power gives us the power, gives us the authority to overcome the dominion of sin in our lives. And so Paul is saying, hey, do not yield to sin anymore. Okay, because not that, hey, I can't overcome temptation. I can't overcome this weakness. I can't overcome that. You know, I have been born with this. I've been living with this. But we don't have those excuses because Paul says, you know, the power of sin is broken over our bodies. Okay, and uh, Christ's resurrection power in us gives us the power um, you know, to not to yield to sin and not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Okay, so that is the third ethical application that we must stop yielding to sin because of our new identity, because that we have been raised with uh, Christ, we are also resurrected with Christ. Okay, so that is um, lesson 11. Okay. I don't know if any of you have been taking notes or any of these points, but uh, uh, 
very interesting about to learn so many new facts and uh, truths about the resurrection. It has such a you know uh, wide um, uh, things that we could learn about and really uh, you know uh, know the truths what Christ's resurrection has accomplished for us and what it does for us. Any questions? Anyone likes to ask any questions? You have any doubts? Anything you all like to say? Anything that you all don't agree with? You can also say that. Why are all of you so quiet? Are you bored of uh, <laughs> starting chapter 11? I hope you're not bored. I, I was, I'm quite interested in, uh, excited to teach. No, sister, we're just fascinated. Thank you, Warren. Okay, no questions, no doubts. Then we'll move on to chapter 12, which is our second last chapter. Uh, his promised return. Okay. Now, um, it's basically few scripture passages in this chapter uh, because um, as you look at the last line in this chapter, it says, we will cover in detail his return for the church and his rule on the earth in the course on the end times. So uh, I know you will have a lot of questions, hundreds of questions on the end times, but you can hold your horse till you come to... Uh, the whole course on the end times. I think you will do that in second year, in the second semester. So you can, uh, you know, you have uh, a detailed study in Vasashish. I think we'll be teaching you that. So, but we will just look at a few uh, scripture references for this lesson, and then I'm not going to run you through the entire uh, details of it. Okay, uh, you can wait till we study it in the sun. Okay, uh, so. Chapter 12, his promised return. Um, the same Jesus will return again. Amen. Okay, so he'll not be someone with uh, some other kind of body, some other kind of looks. The same Jesus will return again. Uh, let's read Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11, please. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Yes, so he'll come in the like manner, just like you saw him go, he will come back. So Jesus will return for his church, uh, and that is called the rapture. Okay, uh, the rapture will take place before the seven year tribulation. So all those who believe in Jesus, okay, will be caught up here and we will be with him. Okay, and then we'll come back for the thousand year millennium rule. Okay, so the thousand year millennium rule, um, some of you will be prime ministers, chief ministers, great officials, big officials, depending on how faithful, sincere you have been and how you have stewarded what God has given to you here and now. Okay, So even as you're living your life now, sometimes you think, you know, hey, I'm in this workplace and um, I'm living a morally, ethically a right life and doing what God wants me to do. And because of that, I'm not getting any promotion. I'm not getting any pay hike. I'm not, um, you know, climbing up the ladder of success. Um, and, you know, because I'm not doing things that are wrong, you know, my bosses are kind of pushing me out and losing jobs. But, uh, you know, and you want to give up, you know, and you want to, you think, you know, being morally, ethically, uh, living a righteous life is of no use. But, you know, there is a future reform. Okay, that is a hope of resurrection. You know, the ethical significance that we live resurrected lives. Okay. So here also, even if you are in the ministry, you're living um, 
ethical, uh, morally right life. You know, you you just go to some place where God has called you to do this. You know, nobody knows about you. Nobody, you know, in the Bible College here, we have all these great missionaries whose uh, wall uh, pictures and wall hangings we have. And nobody knows about you. You're insignificant, but laboring hard for the Lord, working hard. And then you just die, you know. But there is a great reward for you. You need to be faithful because we serve a God who is faithful, will reward us, and, uh, you know, will bless the work of our hands, of course. But, um, yes, in the seven, in the millennium, who uh, thousand-year millennium reign, you know, you will receive your rewards and also eternally as well. John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3. Can somebody read that, please? Can I read, sister? Yes, please, sister Gertrude. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. So here, uh, you know, Jesus will come back, take us to be with him where he is. He's preparing a place for us. Ephesians 5.27. Can somebody read that, please? That he might <laughs> present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Amen. So he's going to present us as a glorious church without spot, blemish, okay, as holy unto the Lord. Okay, first Thessalonians, first Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Can somebody else read first Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, please. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest your sorrows as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. So Paul is writing what is going to happen. The Holy Spirit is... Inspiring Paul is writing what is going to happen the, in the last days, okay, the end time when we be raptured. And then there will be, after this, the rapture will be the, uh, the end of the tribulation, the, the seven year um, uh, tribulation period. And the end of the tribulation, we see that Jesus will come, establish his kingdom here on earth, he will rule and reign for a thousand years. Okay, that is in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 4. So can somebody read that, please? Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He said, hold of the dragon. He laid hold of the dragon. That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bowed him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been he hid it for their witnesses to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. 
and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so here it's talking about uh, the millennium rule. You know, when uh, when during the millennium rule, Satan will be thrown into the bottomless pit, and then he will be released, and then there will be the final judgment. Okay, but this is just very briefly. You also have a chapter in doctrinal uh, uh, foundations. Okay, but also the end times course where you will study in detail. Okay, any questions you have? I'm sure, you have lots of questions on this, but anything? Sister, rapture and the second coming are two different instances. Rapture is a uh, lifting up of the church. And uh, second coming is after the tribulation. So basically, uh, there is the rapture. Then you have the first half of the tribulation. Okay. Then you will have the second half of the tribulation. Uh, and there are various, um, you know, what happens in the first half of the tribulation. Everything you can read in Revelation chapter six. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 in um, even even in um, in in Revelation chapter um, 11 okay and then you'll have the second half of the tribulation again that you can read in Revelation chapter 6 um, Revelation chapter 13 um, and uh, then we'll you know the opening of the seven seals and the seven trumpet judgments uh, you know the the seven bowls of plagues and uh, the Antichrist plans uh, uh, a war against God. And then, you know, it's the preparations for the, the battle of the Armageddon. And then uh, the seven bowls that you read in Revelation chapter 16, verse 18, will be poured out. And then will be the battle of the Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. Okay. So that is the second coming of Jesus when. Um, the, the battle of Armageddon, which is um, described in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, we also read about it in Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, the battle will start when, when, when Christ uh, descends from heaven with his angels and with the believers and uh, the armies of the world, you know, with their human weapons and there will be no match for God and all will be thoroughly defeated and um, killed. Okay. And then we um, see that the Antichrist, the false prophet who also is there during the tribulation period, you know, um, uh, uh, will be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. But Satan, on the other hand, will be locked up in the abyss for a thousand years. And then he will be released um, uh, after the thousand year period. Okay. Uh, and all the unbelievers who participated in the uh, uh, in the battle of the Armageddon will be killed and be sent to um, hell. Okay, so yes, that is the second coming. So rapture and then second coming of Jesus, because when he comes, the rapture will be only in the air. They can see Jesus, but we will all be caught up with him. It will come the second time for the battle of the Armageddon and then the thousand year millennium. Okay. Did that help, Lucy? Yes, sister. Thank you. Any other questions anyone else has? No questions? Okay, so uh, Sanjay's question is, considering the times we're living in with global conflict increasing, how far do you think we are from the rapture? How far do you think you're from the rapture? Okay, so one student did this. Okay. I really don't know because Jesus himself says you don't know the day or the hour. Okay. But if you look at the signs, study the signs that is there, uh, yes, we are uh, close. Uh, there is still a lot of 
historical things that are to be take to take place. Um, the building of the temple and desecrating of the temple and all of those things that will happen. And then we we'll know as those signs appear, we know, okay, we are closer, we are closer, we are closer. But yes, uh, God is patient, is long suffering, and there are many who do not know the, the truth, who do not know the gospel. So I think even as we think that the rapture is soon, we have this ethical significance that we need to share the gospel and, uh, you know, so that many of them are raised up in Christ. That should be our uh, goal now, okay? That, hey, I am going to be caught up in the rapture. What about my loved ones? What about my neighbors? What about the people that I, you know, ministering to, teaching to, working along with, right? God is concerned about them. So we need to be concerned about that this way. Yes. Did that help, Sanjay? Okay. Anyone else any questions? Okay, if not, we'll end class and then we'll look at the last chapter next Tuesday. We don't have class this uh, Friday because it's Good Friday and then, uh, then you know, we'll meet only on um, Tuesday. So happy Resurrection Sunday to all of you. And even as you celebrate uh, and we all celebrate what Christ has done on the cross and his resurrection, I hope all that we studied will come back to mind, will um, bear more uh, significance and a deeper significance, a deeper reverence, a deeper, um, you know, uh, obligation as well to what God has done and what we need to do. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a uh, it's Tuesday today, right? Not this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Have a good week ahead, everyone. Thank you.